Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord God. We praise you, Lord. You are worthy, King Jesus of the glory and the honor. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Hallelujah, Jesus. Blessed be your name, O oh God. Hallelujah. King of glory. We just want to be with you. We honor your name, O oh God. We exalt you. We lift you up. You're worthy <clears throat> of the praise and the glory, God. You are the rock of our salvation. Our God in whom we can trust and depend on. We can call on you, Lord God, any time of the day. And you will answer us according to your will. Hallelujah. You are the lion of the tribe of Judah. You are the living word. You are the breath that we breathe, oh God. The activity of our lambs. Everything belongs to you, oh God. We lift you up, King Jesus, today. Because you're worthy of the praise, oh God. Worthy of the praise and the glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Amen. We're going to go ahead and get started. Bless the Lord. O oh, my soul and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Amen. God bless you, uh, Brother Eric. Amen. We're going to go ahead and get started. So let's open up a word of prayer. <clears throat> I pray, pray that you all have a wonderful day. Happy Valentine's Day to everyone. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you for this moment this opportunity, oh God, to share your word once again. I pray, oh God, that you speak to our hearts by divine revelation. Give us a rhema word, a word that will help change our minds and our hearts, oh God, to become more and more like you every day in our daily living. We ask, oh God, you forgive us for our sins, knowing and unknowingly, oh God, cleanse us from, from all unrighteousness, saturating your anointing powers by your grace. Let your blood purify, oh God, and make us holy, Father. You are holy. And we thank you, Lord God, for every person that come on tonight, that they will hear a word that will help inspire, edify, build them up in their faith, to trust you, God, even change their lives for the better. And we give you thanks, we give you praise in Jesus' name for healing, God, for those who need healing. We release your anointing, God, right now to touch their minds, their bodies, and their souls, oh God, Deacon Allen, Brother Willie, oh God, and many others dealing with cancer, Father God, and Macbeth, oh God, we pray for all those who deal with any type of uh, sickness in their bodies, God, that you touch right now in a supernatural way to heal and deliver and set them free. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm excited today because God is good and the word is good. And I tell you, every time I begin to teach this word, it's something I hear to help me become a better person every day. As I learn how to yield to the voice of the Holy Spirit, every day we're being perfected. Every day we're being changed. Every day something is breaking off of us as we learn how to submit to his lordship and his authority. Truly, God is amazing. He's sovereign and he's holy. And tonight, tonight we want to talk about from our book, The Bait of Satan. We're still in this book. chapter. Uh, we're going to be in chapter 11 tonight. But last week we talked about uh, being in, walking in humility 
and servanthood. Walk in humility and servanthood. And that's one thing we want to always do is learn how to humble ourselves that God can use us for his glory, for the upbuilding of his kingdom. And many times we get entrapped and ensnared by the words of our mouth. We want to talk about the latter part of chapter 10, um, edification, edification. It says the edification test, the edification test. And when you think of the word edify, it's a word that means um, the state of being edified or uplifted. It's a word that means building. And that's what Christ wants us to know, according to the word of God, that we are to uplift one another according to the word of God. Because when Christ came into our lives, he came to uplift us. We also are, can edify by instructing or improving someone morally or intellectually. And that's another uh, form of edification, to uplift someone, instruct them, to guide them, to lead them, to direct them in the truth of God's word. And it's a guarantee that God will have his way in their lives. As we know, in this time and season, many people are hurting, many people are broken, many people are torn apart. So much has been happening in, in society. A lot of death been taking place. And God is still still healing. He's still healing the broken heart and binding the wounds of his people. But we have to learn how to allow the Lord to come in and let his mercy and his grace fill our hearts. And I tell you, when you do that, the Lord himself will begin to magnify himself through you. He will display his mercy, his grace, his compassion his gentleness, his meekness, his forbearance, because we need it. We all need to be lifted up in our faith. We need to be lifted up. If you follow along in the book, it'll be page 114. In the book, page 114. And then um, we're going to go into chapter 11, which talks about, chapter 11 is really good too because it's dealing with unforgiveness. A person who cannot forgive has forgotten how great a debt God has forgiven them. So chapter 11 is forgiveness. You don't give, you don't get. You don't give, you don't get. And that's what forgiveness is required in our lives. So tonight we want to pick up where we left off last week, talking about the attitude of, hum of humility, the attitude of servanthood, because a lot of times <clears throat> Jesus made it clear to the disciples, if anyone desired to be great in the kingdom, he must first become a servant. And that's very important as a child of God to learn how to serve one another. Because so many times we become selfish, we become hardened hearted, we overlook the less fortunate people that we pass in our daily activities of life, and we neglect the people God has placed in your direction for you to minister to because of a prideful heart. In Ephesians chapter 4, Begin at verse 11. In Ephesians chapter 4, begin at verse 11. And it says, And he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And that's what God has done, my brother and my sister, for us. When we learn how to surrender to his lordship and authority, he says he placed some gifts in the body of Christ, not just for your own use, for the building of the church. Every member of the body of Christ has a gift, has a talent, has something God has given them. And he's holding you accountable for that talent he placed in your life. In the Amplified, it says like this, and his gifts and his gifts to the church were varied, and he himself appointed some as apostles, special messengers, representatives, some as prophets who speak a new message from God to the people, some as evangelists who spread the good news of salvation, and some as pastors and teachers to shepherd and guide and instruct. And he did this to fully equip and perfect the saints, God's people, for the work of service, to build up the body of Christ, the church. Verse 13, until we all reach oneness in the faith 
and in the knowledge of the Son of God, growing spiritually to become mature believers, reaching to the full, the measure of the fullness of Christ, manifesting his spiritual completeness and exercising our spiritual gifts in unity. And that's what God wants the body of Christ to become, unified. And when we come unify every gift that he names here, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teachers, all work together in one accord for one purpose, and that is to become to the full, complete measure of who Christ is in our life, the spiritual maturity. Immature Christians, immature Christians will find themselves always argumental, always have an attitude, always ready to fight, always want to get in, in, in a confrontation with people because they, they haven't been converted in their spirit. But a lot of people confess conversion with their mouth, but they really haven't believed it in their heart. Salvation is a work on the inside of the heart. It's not something that we just say from our mouth because it sounds good. Salvation is a work that God does through the work of Jesus Christ in our hearts to bring us to the knowledge of who he is as the son of God and give us a revelation that will provoke, that will promote and provoke us to spiritual growth. If you're not ready to grow in the body of Christ, you're going to always find yourself a baby. We talked about this in previous lessons, how you have some people in the body of Christ who have not come to full maturity or the stature of growth because they're still desiring the sin sealed milk of the word. They're still a baby. The word called a baby. A baby is someone that you have to care for, you have to nurture, you have to carry until they learn how to crawl and begin to walk. But until they begin to have a desire to want to mature, to be edified, to be uplifted, to be instructed, to be guided, to be given wisdom and counsel in the knowledge of the word of God, they're going to always be lacking truth and revelation of who God is. And we have to teach the word of God. we got to preach and teach the word of God. The foundation of Jesus Christ is the gospel. The gospel is Jesus Christ came into the world, born in a manger, went to a cross, died, was buried, and rose again. That's the gospel. That we can re preach, preach salvation, that you can receive the same power of resurrection in your life, the same power that raised Christ from the dead has also quickened you when you come to the revelation of understanding of the measure of what Christ has done for us. That's a problem we have because a lot of people don't want to accept the full measure. They still comfortable being immature. They're comfortable still drinking the bottle. They're comfortable still wearing diapers. They're comfortable still crawling and not even walking yet because they haven't applied themselves to the word of God. The reason why Jesus made the statement in John chapter 6, I think it's around the 37 verse somewhere, somewhere around there. He talked about unless you eat of my flesh and drink my blood, you can have no part of me. And the reason why is because if I don't desire to have an intimate relationship with Christ Jesus, I will continue to stay in the state of a mind of an immature baby. Babies are immature. Babies make messes. Babies stink. And you got to clean them up. And God is saying the same thing tonight. Stop being a baby. It's time to start growing and maturing in your walk with the Lord and in your purpose God created you that's to display his glory. You cannot display the glory of God still being a baby. Because you got to learn in order to grow and teach somebody else the foundation. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That foundation, that solid rock is Jesus Christ. He said, upon myself, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell, the power of hell, the power of the enemy cannot influence the church. Because he said, I am the rock that my church is built on. Then he used an analogy of building a house on sand. And when the storms come and the winds blow, great is the fall of that house. But a house that's built on the rock. He said the wind comes, the storm comes, it blows on this house, the house still stands. Why? Because I'm resting in the victory of Jesus Christ. And we have to get to the place where we desire to grow in grace 
and in the knowledge of who he is. So, in our book, hallelujah, Jesus, in our book, on page 114, page 114, if you're following in the, in the uh, digital uh, Kindle version, it would be page 100, page 100. So if you follow in the Kindle version or in the book, 114, or the Kindle version, it'll be page 100. And it's the book, we've been talking about this for quite a while, The Bait of Satan. This is what we're talking about, The Bait of Satan. Because a lot of people say, living free, what they say down there, living free from the daily traps of offense. Because a lot of people become offended. When things don't go their way, they become offended. If someone says something you don't like, they become offended. If you cross them off on this dri driving down the street, you cut them off, they're ready to shoot you. Why? Because an offense is in their heart. An immature Christian will behave in the same format as a sinner man. The same attitude, the same way a sinner would respond to situations it's the same what Christian would if they don't say the word of God. You don't have no lack of no self-control. You don't have no temperance. You don't have no discipline. You're just a walking time bomb ready to explode or whoever give you the business. And God is saying tonight, as a child of God, we got to do that as Galatians chapter 5, verse 28. Put on, put on, walk in that fruit. Get that fruit in your life. So here we go. The edification test. The Apostle Paul, in writing to Romans, summed up the heart of God in this matter. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Why is that? Because if I'm pursuing peace, I'm not easily offended. If I'm pursuing the peace of God, and the word says, and, and the Lord said, I will bless my people, let them enjoy abundant peace, and rest in my security. So if God promises to allow you to have an abundant peace, that's a peace that never ends. Even in sorrow, even a broken heart, God says, I will give you abundant peace. Because I know how to reach your heart right where you are, to calm your spirit, to bring healing in your soul. I know how to edify you, even in the place of disappointment. I know how to go into the core of your heart to build you up, that you stand firm in the faith of Jesus Christ. The word tells to build yourself up upon your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Why? Because when I pray in the Holy Ghost, Praying in tongues or praying with the way your prayer language is God giving you. You begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost intercedes for you with groanings that cannot be uttered. So what he does, when I pray in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit begins to interpret my prayer before the Father because of the blood of the Lamb. And he begins to magnify my praise in my situation that I can overcome whatever situation I'm dealing with. So therefore, let us, the body of Christ, the same one who gave these gifts in the church, pursue the things which make peace and the things which by one may edify another. So we have an assignment. As a child of God, we have an assignment, and that is to edify. That don't mean... Talk about your brother and sister when they look bummy and dirty and they come to church. That don't mean gossip about anybody in church who may have a problem in their life or their marriage may be on a rocky, rocky foundation. That don't mean you go and gossip about anybody in church. You need to pray for them. If you see a person, the Bible says, if your brother only taking a fault, you who are spiritual, restore them in the spirit of meekness lest ye also be tempted. Why? Because I can be tempted with the same problem they're going through if I'm not careful, if I'm not prayed up, if I'm not seeking the face of God, if I'm not surrendered to his lordship, his authority. It is so awesome. It is so awesome when God gives us revelation about who he is in our lives. 
only when we come to the place in ourselves, we surrender to his lordship and his authority. We should make it our aim not to cause another to stumble because of our personal liberty. We should make it a, a righteous choice to not put a stumbling block in your brother's way. I remember last week we talked about in Matthew chapter 7, one of those verse 1 talking about judge not least you be judged. For since the same measure you meet, it be measured back to you again. So what the word is talking about, I shouldn't put a stumbling block in my brother's way. He said, if you got a moat in your eye and you try to take the beam out of your brother's eye, you're a hypocrite. You got to first deal with your own issue, your own sinful nature, your own problem before you can help somebody else. Because when I come to the Lord and tell God, God, my brother needs your help, but help me first, God. Forgive me for my sin, the little leaven I allowed in my heart, the little bitty thing I allowed to take control of my mind. Cleanse me and saturate me in your anointing. And guess what happens? God does it. Then I can go to my brother, go to my sister, and I can tell them, you know what, I understand you're going through something this time. I just want to pray with you. I want to encourage you. No matter what you're going through, God still loves you. God still cares about you. And when I come to them in love, not being a tail bearer, one that takes garbage and spread it around. So it's like a dump truck. What if the garbage man comes to take your, car, your garbage from in front of your house, your apartment building, and all of a sudden he released the, 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 release the, uh, the wagon and just dump it all on the street? You got a big mess. What if he just forgot to lock the door, the cabinet, the cabinet on the dump truck, and he's driving on the street and your garbage is flying out, just flying out? That's the same way we do in the body of Christ. We become a garbage collector, junk in our trunk, and we spread it everywhere we go. And God is saying tonight, don't be a vessel of the enemy to cause your brother to stumble or your sister to stumble. What we do may even be permissible according to the scriptures, but ask yourself, does it seek the edification of another's or myself? You might be doing something to help somebody, but you're doing it out of a self-righteous heart. You really don't have the right intentions, the right motives. And God is saying, we need to ask ourselves. It's a test. It's a test for ourselves. What, am I doing my servanthood to help somebody out of love and response to the way God loved me and cared for me? Or am I doing it for self-gratification? Am I doing it out of a selfless heart? Am I doing it for my own motives, my own intentions to build myself, to make myself look good because I helped the poor, or I fed the hungry, or I took in the lost and gave them shelter? God says we need to check ourselves. Because if we don't check ourselves, we'll wreck ourselves. My God, my God, my God. Another scripture. Since so all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all, not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each other's as well-being. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks, or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. So whatever you do, you have to have the attitude of Christ to do it out of love and response to God's love for you to help somebody else that they might be saved. A sinner man may come up to you and ask you to give them some money. And one thing God had me do with people that come and ask for money is pray for them. Take a moment to share a word from the Lord with the individual and say, can I pray for you? Before I give you this money, can I pray for you? And pray that God will save their soul and deliver them from their poverty mentality or situation. And you know what? 
You plant the seeds of righteousness. God says, I will rain on that seed and bring forth a harvest in their lives. I may never see the harvest come forth. There are times where God had me pray for individuals and then years later, run across the same individual and they said, you prayed for me about 10 years ago. And I want to let you know that God answered, my, answered your prayer. He turned my life around and I'm doing so much better than I was 10 years ago. God will do that for you only if you have the attitude of servanthood. That's why we talk about servanthood because servanthood is putting someone else above yourself to make sure they're taken care of first before you take care of yourself. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23 and 24, and then verse 31 to 33. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23 and 24, and verse 31 and thir through 33. I encourage you to allow the Holy Spirit to funnel every area of your life through this scripture passage. Allow him to show you any hidden motives or agendas that are for your profit and not for the profit of others. That's a really great point. So when I pray, Lord, show me my heart. Am I doing my servanthood for your glory or for myself, for my own profit? Am I helping people to get self-appraisal, self-righteousness, or am I humbling myself to promote your glory? No matter what area of life you might embrace, accept his challenge to live as a servant of all. That is very important. No matter what area of your life you might embrace, no matter what the challenges are, we have to live our lives as a servant for all people. And that's what God's looking for, a servant heart, an attitude of Christ. They say, okay, I'm going to do what God wants me to do to help build somebody up, to help deliver them, to help them become free. Just like I remember years ago, I run across um, this young man going to the rescue mission. And I was married at the time, and I didn't know where the rescue mission was. I had never been down there. So I was going down Wells, and I got in the vicinity, and I didn't know I passed the building I was going to. So the young man was standing on the corner. And I stopped and said, hey, young man, can you help me? He said, what's going on? I said, I'm trying to find the rescue me. Oh, he said, you just passed it. I said, I said you want to get in and take me over there where it is? Because I got some things I need to take in there. Went to the rescue mission, had a few bags of clothing that I wanted to donate to the rescue mission. And the young man helped me take this stuff in there. And at the same time, I was praying. And I said, Lord, if you want, me to help this young man give his life over to you, then I need you, Lord God, to touch his heart to go home with me to my house. And I said to the young man, I said, uh, you mind coming to my house? I said, I'll see you if you stand out here. He said, yeah. I said, well, I, I want to help you out. I said, I want you to come to my house. Took the young man to my house, and I sat on my table. I began to pray with him and led him to salvation. The young man gave his life to Christ in my house. That's been over 10 years ago. Gave the young man a place to stay for about a couple of weeks in my house. The young man stayed, took him to church, started helping himself walk in his identity. And then when his girlfriend, who was incarcerated at the same time, got out, she pulled him right back to the street. But I did what God told me to do. Because God told me to open my home up to this young man, a perfect stranger. Had no clue who he was. Never met him before in my life. And God said to help him. Give him some clothes. Gave him suits. Gave him shoes. Gave him underwear. I gave him things he needed to make him feel better about himself. Even took him to job interviews. And the moral of that story is, Jesus said, what you do to the least of them, you've done it unto me. You don't take strength in your house unless you're being compelled by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit not compelling you to tell you to do this, don't you dare try to do that. Because you might put yourself in danger. But I felt a strong conviction in my heart to serve a young man as Christ has served me. And because of that, young man, God saved his life. 
So I want to encourage you tonight. You walk in the spirit, as it says, accept his challenge to live as a servant for all. Use your liberty in Christ to set others free, not to exert your own rights. We talked about this in previous lessons. We have to let go of our rights. Because when I come to Christ, the only right I have is to live in his righteousness. The only right I have is to love one another. The only right I have is to serve one another as Christ has done for me. That was one of the guidelines of the ministry of Paul who wrote, we give no offense in anything that our ministries may not be blamed. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3. Because when you get to the place where you recognize when I walk in love and I surrender myself to the will of God, I don't have time for offense in my heart. I don't have time for jealousy in my heart. I don't have time for unforgiveness in my heart. Because those are the very attributes the enemy uses against a child of God to keep you in bondage. Here's another scripture. Psalms 119, matter of fact, Acts, Acts chapter 20, verse 32. Acts chapter 20, verse 32. And it says, And now I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among those who are sanctified. So I commend you to God and the word of his grace. So to God's word, I commend you to the word. But the word has the power through the grace of God to build you, to edify, to uplift, to strengthen, to encourage, to empower you, and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. What's the inheritance? Jesus Christ. Every promise he has bestowed upon us in his word is our inheritance. Just like when a person dies and they leave a will of a testament in their inheritance. They leave all the possessions to certain individuals who they deem to be theirs after their death. Jesus did the same thing. When he died on the cross, he left us an inheritance of grace. And in that inheritance is my peace, my long-suffering, my gentleness, my meekness, forbearance, temperance, self-control, all those things and many other promises God has written in his word that I'm a blessed seed of Abraham and I cannot be cursed. It's an inheritance. So every promise God has spoken in his word is mine among the saints who are sanctified. So we all benefit from the package. We all benefit from the inheritance package that Christ has provided for every believer. But a lot of believers don't know that because they don't study their Bible. They don't read their word. And when you study God's word, you get the word in your spirit, the word begins to reveal to you everything God has spoken in his word concerning you to bless you, to enrich you, to empower you every day to make your pathway smooth from a crooked way of life. So don't use your liberty for your own self, but it's a use your liberty in Christ to set others free. Not to assert your own rights. That was one of the guidelines of Paul's ministry. We give no offense in anything that our ministries may not be blamed. So we don't want to have a bad name on our ministry. So if you have a ministry, what he's talking about, your ministry needs to stand up for itself. Because if I'm preaching the gospel, I have a ministry my ministry is not going to bring offense to anybody. And if it does offend them, hopefully it will offend them to turn their life to Jesus. But he's saying here, we give no offense in anything. So I'm not going to try to offend you. That our ministry will not be blamed. So I don't want people coming back and giving my ministry a bad name and saying that, that, that preacher is a hypocrite. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. He ain't real. He's fake. But he said, I don't want my ministry to have a bad name. And that's what we have to do with God's word. Allow that word to manifest in our heart. 1 Peter chapter 2, 
First Peter chapter 2, verse 2, it says, Like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it may grow in respect of salvation. So we got a desire to grow. God's not going to force you to grow. He can only persuade you to grow through the word. He's not going to come into your life and say, you need to grow. Stop being immature. Stand up and, and be mature in the things of God. Be a man. Be a woman. He ain't going to come to you like that. The word of God said, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word so that it might make them grow in respect to salvation. So the salvation, it draws you from the word. The salvation, it perfects you from the word. And that's what he's talking about. So Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. The church matures. The church advances. The church increases in stature, in wisdom, in knowledge. When we come together in unity and enjoy the abundant peace, then God's word will cause you to have an attitude of fear of the Lord and comfort from the Holy Spirit. As we continue to increase in our maturity. And that's what he's talking about. You got to want the maturity. You guys not going to force you to mature. So we're going to chapter 11. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Okay. Forgiveness. Don't give. You don't get. You don't give. You don't get. Go to Mark. Go to St. Mark, chapter 11. This is our scripture we use every Sunday in our church. We use this scripture every Sunday. And it's a very powerful scripture to apply to your life and your daily walk with the Lord. If you want to get the attitude of Christ, get in the Word. Get in the Word. Mark 11, chapter, verse 22. Mark 11, chapter, beginning at verse 22. And it says, And Jesus answering says unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever should say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt his heart, but shall believe those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he say. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. And when you stand praying, verse 25, forgive. If you have all against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Verse 26, but if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. And this is one scripture that really has a lot of power in it. Is a life changing because it talks about forgiveness. In the Amplified, Mark 11, chapter, verse 22 to 26, Jesus replied, Have faith in God constantly. I assure you and most solemnly say unto you, Whoever says to this mountain, Be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, in God's unlimited power. That is so awesome. That is awesome. But believe what he says is going to take place. It will be done for him in accordance with God's will. So first of all, I got to have constant faith in God's power that whatever I speak that's going in my life, commanded to change and a mountain to move, it's going to obey me. So it will be lifted up and thrown to the sea only if I don't doubt in my heart. Because I'm trusting in God's unlimited power. But then it goes on 
It says, but believe what he says is going to take place. It will be done for him according to God's will. For this reason, I am telling you, whatever things you ask for in prayer, in accordance with God's will, believe with confident trust that you have received them. So for this reason, I'm telling you, whatever things you ask for in prayer, in accordance with God's will, believe with confident trust. So I got to trust God. I got to believe in his power. I got to know with assurance whatever I'm praying to ask God to do in my life, that you shall receive them and they will be given to you. So it can't be given if I don't ask for it. It can't be given if I don't pray in faith. It can't be given if I don't trust God's power and ability. But then he goes on so whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. Drop the issue, let it go. When you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. Drop the issue, let it go. For, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions and wrongdoings against him and others. So our trespasses, it's not just against people, but it's against God. And our wrongdoings, it's against God, as well as other people. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your transgressions. Transgressions. So God can't forgive you if you can't forgive somebody else. That's a message for somebody tonight. If you hold on to any form of unforgiveness in your heart, you need to check your heart. Allow the Spirit of God to evaluate your heart, to bring to the forefront any offense of unforgiveness that you hold it on to, that you let it go. In our book, it says, for the remainder of the book, I want to turn our attention to the consequences of refusing to let go of offense and how to get free from it. Jesus meant what he said, but if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. We live in a culture where we don't always mean what we say. Consequently, we do not believe other means what they say to us. A person's word is not taken seriously. We get tested that. We, we all know about that. Because sometimes you say things, or I say things I don't mean. I say it out of anger. I say it out, out of response to the flesh. So people, I don't take people seriously. You don't take people seriously sometimes because you get in your flesh. When your flesh is aroused, someone tick you off, you say things that you shouldn't have said, but you meant it. Because Jesus makes it clear, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth is going to speak. So we have to be careful of what we allow the enemy to bring out of our mouths. Just because I think unrighteous thoughts doesn't mean I got to act upon it. It begins in childhood. Parent tells the child, if you don't, the parent says the child, if you do that again, you'll get a spanking. The child not only does it again, but several times more and after that. Following each episode, the child received the same warning from his parent. Usually, no corrective action is taken. How many of you have done that before to children? Think about it. We all have done it before. If you, you don't stay out of my stuff, I'm going to whip you. You can go in my closet again and, and mess with my stuff and I'm going to whip you. You go touch that stove again, I tell you not to. Get in my cake and all the stuff. The stuff I tell you not to do, they do it anyway. I'm going to whip you. And we never follow with actions. It's only words. Because words without faith, faith without works, is no action. And so the thing we do, no corrective action takes place because I'm just speaking words to put fear in the child. The child says, oh, they say that all the time. We do God the same way. God says, stay away, stay away from certain individuals. Don't go to certain places. 
and I listen to my flesh, and I'm driven to go with my flesh what to do anyway, uh, God knows my heart. God understands my weakness. God knows I'm going to repent. Yes, he does. He knows how wicked we are. He knows how stubborn we are. He knows the consequences of the action that we're going to get. But we don't know the consequences because we're just blindly doing what the flesh wants to do. If correction does take place, it's either lighter than what, we, what was promised or more severe because the parent is now frustrated. How many times have you chastised your child out of anger because you're frustrated? You done told them over and over and over, don't get in those snacks, don't get those chips, don't get that ice cream, don't go eat that cake. And they, they do it anyway. Clean up your room, pick up the toys on the floor. You better have your room clean or come back in there. And they don't do it. So you go in there again, you better have this room clean. They still don't do it. Because they're not taking you serious. Because all you do is just talking. And also now you're frustrated and you're angry. And then you want to beat them half to death because you're mad. When well, you should have handled the first time in the right way. Sometimes a child, like God says, when a father loves his child, he chastens him. That means corrects him. If God did not love us, he would never chasten us. He lets us keep doing what we want to do. Bump our head, make the same old mess, get the same old entrapment, be baited by the enemy, fall in the same ditch over and over and over because he knows we're hard-headed. We can become hard-headed when it comes to the word of God. We get so callous in our hearts while our head becomes so stubborn when God tells us not to do certain things, we do it anyway because of the flesh. Paul says, I buffet my flesh daily. I beat this flesh under subjection to the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to get to the place where you recognize I need to cast down the imagination of the flesh and get the mind of Christ. Bring those thoughts to subjection to the Lord Jesus Christ where he can control my thought life. 2 Corinthians 10 and 5. Because I don't do this, I'm going to continue to be stubborn, hard-hearted, rebellious, callous, resist, resisting God's correction, his leadership, his lordship, his authority in my life because of my flesh doesn't want to submit. The word tells us, Submit you therefore to God. Resist, oppose, go against the devil, and he'll flee from you. The devil knows when you're just a, a lip server. He knows when you're just talking, and you have no power behind your talk. He knows when you just a uh, hearsay. I heard someone talk about the word. I heard what God did for somebody else. But God ain't do it for me. So you really don't believe. So what you've been praying for, there's no results or manifestation because you became a lip server. God knows the moment we have a sincere heart ready to turn to repentance. And he knows the words that God knows those are his, but the wicked he knows from afar. We become wicked in our lifestyles, every time we oppose God's word. Every time you know the word, you speak the word, you try to tell other people how to live by the word, and you're a hypocrite, not doing it yourself. A pretender. God told the children, of read Isaiah chapter 59, the whole chapter, when you get a chance. He told the children of Israel, I'm going to expose your pretended righteousness. I'm going to show your nakedness so you can repent. And you don't want God to strip you of who you are just so you repent. Because when God steps in the, in the place to bring correction in your life, it ain't good. Because say no discipline is pleasing at the time, but it yields a peaceable fruit, a surrendered fruit of righteousness. And that's what God is looking for. A heart that recognizes. I need you, Lord God. I messed up. I rebelled against you. I went back to the old relationship again. 
I started back drinking the bottle again, started getting back in alcohol, indulging, overindulging alcohol again. I started fornicating, adulterating. I started being a liar. I started becoming a thief. I started doing the things that I used to do before I came to Christ because of my flesh became weak. No excuse. Thou inexcusable old man, who are you to flee the wrath of God to come? Read it in Romans chapter 2. You can't escape the judgment of God when it begins to fall upon you because of your rebellious heart. But God gives you a warning before destruction. Both responses send a message to the child that you don't mean what you say or what you think isn't true. The child learns to think that's not everything authority figures say is true. So not everything authority figures will say is true. So he becomes confused about when and if he should take authority figures seriously. All because you can say, I'm going to get you like a wolf. What does it say? Like the boy cry wolf. I'm going to get you. I told you I'm going to get you. And you never follow up with your word. So the child gets to the place where uh, mom and dad don't mean what they're saying. They've been saying it for a long time. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. And they never get me. So I do what I want to do. I keep on getting rebellious. Keep becoming more stubborn. Be getting messed up. So my whole life become jacked up as a child which carries on to my adult life. All because the discipline was lacked in the childhood. That's why I said train up a child in the way it's go when he's old enough to part from it. If I don't train up a child in the way he should go as, as a child, I'm, I'm doing more damage to that child's growth than good. And God is saying tonight, say what you mean and mean what you say. When it comes to the enemy, you can't play in the devil's pig pen or play pen and continue to live in righteousness. You got to get out of the mud, get out the playpen, and allow yourself to mature and grow up in the things of God. It is a guarantee that God himself will begin to manifest his power and his authority of righteousness to clean you up. His word says you are cleansed through the words that I have spoken unto you. If you receive God's word, God's word is going to mature you. It's going to provoke you to righteousness. It's going to challenge you to get out of your flesh and get into the spirit. When you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's what the word tells us. And we got to get in the word and begin to stand in the word, believe the word, mutter the word. That means speak that word to yourself over and over and over to the gifts of your spirit. Where well, you can live by the word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We're going to close right here. We'll pick it up next week in chapter 11. I pray that something has been said tonight to help encourage you, to stir you up in your faith, to get in your word, to repent if you need to repent, to get back in right standing with God. Allow God to purge you from the habits and addictions, the things you know in your life that's not of God. They can saturate you in his anointing to make you better. And it's a guarantee that God will do what he promised to fill you with the spirit of truth and righteousness. So Lord God, tonight, I thank you. As your word says, the Lord would deliver me in six troubles and in seven, no evil would touch me. Thank you, Jesus. I am confident deep within myself that if I will but touch the hem of your garment, I will be made whole. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. As the knowledge of who you are spreads, the people will send out for the sick and disease in all surrounding regions so they too can touch the hem of your garment. Lord, tonight we press in to touch you, Jesus, and you will heal us from our plagues, our sinful ways. Lord, tonight I will reach for your clothes and touch, touch your hem so that I shall be made whole. 
As the Spirit goes forth in the villages and cities and countries, the sick will be laid before you. They will beg you to touch even the borders of your garments. As they touch you, they will be made whole. Lord, tonight the blind will come before you, begging to touch you, and you will touch them, and their sight will be restored, and they will see things clearly. Father, we thank you for your word tonight, O oh God, as we come in faith to touch the hem of your garment, that you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness, you will saturate us in your truth, O oh God, purify our hearts, that we be cleansed, O oh God. There have nothing to hinder us from touching the hem of your garment to be healed of our infirmities, our sickness, our disease, our sinful ways, O oh God that we can come before you knowing that you will wash us in the blood of the Lamb and purify our hearts that we'll be clean before you. Now, Lord God, I thank you for the word tonight. Let it not fall upon deaf ears, but let it provoke us all to change our hearts in surrendering and humbling ourselves before you that you will be glorified in our lives. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Do anyone have any questions tonight? Anyone have any questions? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 So as always, you might be on here tonight. You might be a backslider. One who once walked with the Lord and you turned and walked away. You might even be one who never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I want to invite you tonight. To pray this simple prayer with me. For the word of God says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God is risen from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. So the Jesus Christ we're talking about tonight is the Savior of the world who said, If I be lifted up, I'll draw men unto me. So I want to invite you to pray this simple prayer with me, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. I come to you, Lord God, acknowledging that I am a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me for my sins, knowing and unknowingly. Come into my heart and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Now come and be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 If you prayed that prayer tonight, the whole host of heaven is rejoicing over one sinner who has turned their lives over to the Lord. And I tell you that God is well pleased in you making that decision to give your heart to him. And there's a guarantee that God will begin to fill you with his truth and his righteousness as we stand fast in the liberty where Christ has made us free. So tonight, you have just been set free. If you prayed that prayer, you've been set free from the power of the enemy. And now you feel in righteousness of the Holy Spirit to live a life that's pleasing to God as a newborn baby in Christ Jesus. But I encourage you to get into a local church, a Bible-believing, teaching church, not just any church, but a church that will help teach you about your new identity in Christ Jesus. Because the Word says that anyone that's born in Christ Jesus has been given a new heart, and God has changed your life for the better. Amen, amen, amen. So I encourage you tonight, continue to stay in the Word, stay in the Word. Stay in the word. Therefore, if any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So you are a new creature in Christ Jesus tonight. So I encourage you, continue to spread the good news of the gospel. Continue to stand fast in Christ Jesus' freedom. Because now you're free to live a life that's pleasing unto the Lord. You might have been one going in the wrong direction. But tonight, God just turned your life around to take you in the right direction of, of righteousness and the pathway of truth that he can lead and guide you in the way he has ordained for you to walk to be a pleasing sacrifice unto him. So there's a link on here if you want to sow a seed into the ministry, the Bible class. It's, it, it's linked on here at the bottom. Feel free to do so. And every seed you sow goes back into the ministry. We are, we're taking donations for our building project. For our church, we're planning to expand our church sometime this year. And also we're taking uh, donations for the books because I'll be, I'll be buying books. Anyone need a book? If you're on here tonight and you need a book, no matter where you are, inbox me. Charles B. Emery, inbox me. If you want one of these books, the beta say the books are $10. You can cash out me the $10 for the book and I'll get you a book. 
And I'm, I'm waiting on an order to come in now. So um, Pastor Denise, your book should be coming shortly in a few days. So I'm waiting on God to, uh, for that book to come. So if anyone want to get a book, feel free to inbox them. Let me know you want one of these books, The Bait of Satan. And I tell you, it's very en enriching into our spiritual growth and life changing. So the Lord says the same. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord turn his face towards you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Until we meet again next week at 2 o'clock and 6 o'clock hour, we will come again to study and break the bread of life, the word of God. You have a good night and happy Valentine's Day to everyone again. And I pray that you continue to be enriched and empowered to study God's word, that you can grow in grace and in the knowledge of who he is in your life. Until next week, shalom. May the peace of God and the wellness of God, the healing of God flow to you. Amen.